Okay, here we are. Uh, welcome to our third annual uh, Barra Symposium at Kelly School of Music. My name is Xuan Wen Chen, a harpsichord professor, and I direct the Collegium Musicum at Kelly. This event was supposed to take place in our own recital hall. Because of the COVID, we have to move it online. I would like to thank our school director, Anthony Mazzocchi, and voice professor Jeffrey Go for their support. We didn't, we didn't want to cancel the event. Instead, we want to share with more people, especially students, this opportunity to learn. It also it connects with different institutions together with more learning resources. I'm happy to see students here today, not only from Montclair State, but also from other schools. Unfortunately, we won't be able to present a concert this year. It is my great honor to welcome Julie Andrzejewski as our special speaker today. I've had the pleasure to work with Julie at Amherst Early Music for a few years. Maybe because of her dance background, she teaches as gracefully as she dances. Mm -hmm. I always enjoy watching her to show dance steps to the class and have students dance with her. Then the magic happens. Mm -hmm. Students are able to apply what their body movement respond to their playing. These presentations will be recorded and will be streamed on our school website on a later date. If you are interested in receiving this information, please email me. We will have a 15 in minutes of intermission, but you don't have to sign off. I'll leave it on. And please stay muted during the event. I'll be collecting questions in the chat box and present them as I see a question is relevant to the timing and or we'll save them for the last 15 minutes of Q&A. And now, let's welcome Julie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's so nice to see new faces and old faces. Um, I'm so, so pleased to be here at Montclair State University remotely and wish to thank Xuan Wen Chen for inviting me uh, to, to share this topic that's so dear to my heart. Um, Oh, even though we are not in the same room, I'm hoping that we can connect with each other by conversing, playing music and dancing together. So I'm hoping that some of you will dance with me. I will begin by giving you some background on Baroque dance, illustrating its direct links to movement in the natural world and to movement and gesture in the Baroque music we play with a focus on the solo works of J.S. Bach that will be played today by some of you. Um, and also the Beaver Passacaglia. That'll be fun too. Along the way, I will teach you a few French Baroque dance steps and phrases to give you a taste of this unique dance style that can directly inform our musical performances, focusing on the bourrée and the sarabande, since that's what the students will be playing. Finally, we can apply this knowledge to the Alamand and sarabande. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Finally, we can apply this knowledge uh, to the Alamand and Saraband that will be played today by students at Montclair and also see how movement in general affects the performances of Bieber's Pasacalia. At the end, I hope to reserve some time to answer your questions and feel free to post them as when said on the chat or save them for the end. There's a lot to cover and in just one session, we can only scratch the surface of this topic. But my goal here is to pique your curiosity and encourage exploration of these concepts in your own musical journeys. So now I'm going to try sharing my screen with you for the first part of my presentation. I hope that's everybody can see that. So I've titled my talk movement in music because this I think is what dance brings to the music we play. Through dance, we learn how to move from note to note, phrase to phrase, and throughout the piece as a whole. This doesn't only apply to dance music, but can be applied to all the music that we play, and particularly to box solo works for violin, cello, and harpsichord. When I mention to musicians that I teach Baroque dance, the number one question about any dance is, what is the tempo? Well, tempo is certainly important particularly when accompanying dancers, but there are other aspects of Baroque dance that are even more helpful to our historically informed performances of dance 
music Julie, and yes. Sorry yes. to interrupt. But, um, you probably want to re share your uh, screen because it's not coming out. Uh, it's oh, it says that I'm sharing. If you do it again. Mm. Can you see it? It says has started springing in just a black. Hmm. Can you see that one? No. Uh oh. Uh, this does say that I'm sheen, uh, screen sharing. Oh, there you go. It comes now. Now. Good. Is it there? Yes, it is. Lovely. Okay. So here are some other things that are important, even more important, I think, than what the tempo is. Knowing about the natural stance. Merely adopting this stance, as described in the dance manuals, aligns our bodies in a way that is most beneficial to music making. Step units, movements that connect the various leg bends, rises, turns, and jumps into a larger gesture, provide much food for thought when shaping sounds with the bow or with air speed. The combination of bends and rises in specific dance steps can be compared to the management of, say, a musician's bow or a singer's breath maintained throughout a short musical gesture before it is released. Dance choreographies illuminate bigger concepts as well. Phrase structure, the structure of a dance as a whole, spatial elements, and rhythmic interplay between the dance steps and the accompanying music that can all bring deeper meaning and understanding to our music. And all of these elements combined inform us of the overall cadence of the piece, a concept that is crucial to the performance of dance movements, whether they were meant to be danced or not. Having spent most of my waking hours steeped in music, dance, or a combination thereof from age five, here I am, budding star, I feel I have a unique window into the relationship between these two arts. During the Baroque period, of course, it was not so rare to be proficient at both of these art forms. Jean-Marie Leclerc, for example, the dashing and virtuosic violinist composer, was also an accomplished dancer, having studied both dance and music in Turin. And of course, there's also Jean-Baptiste uh, Lully. Sharing my thoughts on dance music through the eyes of a violinist dancer has given me not only great pleasure, but also an increasing awareness of how illuminating Baroque dance can be to music musicians in general, and how relevant it is to our understanding of movement, form, phrasing, and gesture in music. Dance is one element in a family of art forms that can cross-pollinate to bring deeper meaning and understanding to our instrumental performances. Singing, poetry, architecture, and painting can also have a great impact on our instrumental music making, as can, of course, rhetoric. All of these aspects accumulate over time so that eventually we build a mental library of expectations. Yay! These expectations, all intertwined with our musical expectations, are then the foundation of our understanding of the various dance types. I will keep coming back to this idea of expectation throughout my talk, since it is tantamount to understanding not only the essence of each dance, but also to realizing what is special about each specific dance, and in our explorations this afternoon, how J.S. Bach meets and actually relies upon these expectations to bring us joy and amusement from the occasional curveballs he throws into his music. It is necessary to point out here, though, that Bach stances in general exhibit more common than uncommon dance traits. And as you will see in my presentation today, most of his stances are quite danceable to the point that phrases and sometimes larger sections from actual choreographies fit well to his music. We know that Bach was invited to many events involving dance during his career, and it is almost certain that he would have joined in, at least on occasion. In short, Bach understood these dance types from the inside out, and we as musicians have the task of realizing this however we see fit in our own musical renderings. Before we return to our, uh, turn to our expectations, sorry, uh, let's have a brief history lesson on what I'm referring to as Baroque dance. 
When I say Baroque dance, I'm referring to the dance in France from roughly the 1660s to 1670. Dance was an important part of court life in France and elsewhere before then, of course, but it wasn't until King Louis XIV established the first official academies of dance in 1661 and music in 1669 that French Baroque dance began to flourish. Before then, Italy was the cultural center of the Western world. The King's superintendent of music, Jean-Baptiste Lully, supplied music for the King's operas and ballets. An accomplished dancer as well as violinist, Lully and the King occasionally danced together in their youth in stage productions held at the court. One such production came when Louis XIV was just 14 years old in an all-night production appropriately titled The Ballet de la Nuit. How do we know about the dance styles and steps? We learn a lot from treatises such as Pierre Rameau's Art of Dancing, where he gives us descriptions and illustrations such as this one. Dancing was part of daily life in the homes of the nobility. Dancing masters would visit the nobles' palaces to give them lessons in dance as well as etiquette. And many of the dancing masters accompanied their students on the violin. And here you can see this little guy. Whoa. <laughs> so I had this timed and I had no idea I was having this timed on me. Okay, so here's the little dancer with his violin back here. He's the dancing master instructing this lovely couple on how to dance in their own home. This type of dance grew in popularity throughout Europe in the mid 18th century. Pierre Rameau is one such dancing master. In his treatise Le Maître Dansé, published in 1725, Rameau provides not only explanations but also pictures on how to stand, bow, take hands and the like. Here is John Essex's version of Rameau's noble stance or what he calls the disposing of the body in his translation of Rameau's treatise. This picture shows us a basic noble stance in which, writes Essek, the head must be upright without being stiff, the shoulders falling back, which extends the breast and gives greater grace to the body, the arms hanging by the side, the hands neither quite open nor shut, the waist steady, the legs extended, and the feet turned outwards. I have endeavored to make this figure as expressive as possible, he says, that at the sight of it, anyone may form the body as it ought to be. And I think we should all try this, uh, this noble stance. So I can't see you, unfortunately, but uh, let's look at this picture. And, and if you're uh, able to stand up and try to emulate what he's saying. So we have our feet turned out and our waist long and our breast open and our arms hanging. And we have this nonchalance uh, when we're doing it. So that we only have specific uh, muscles engaged to hold this lovely posture while still feeling nonchalant and relaxed and giving an air of, of uh, ease to our audience. And I think this is, I'm not just doing this because uh, the dancer dance teacher told me to, but because this really informs, I think, our music making as well. Uh, during the Baroque period, it wasn't such a virtuosic show of what the individual could do, but it was virtuosic within the music or expressive within the music with this overall ease that you apply to your music. So I think you can see this in the noble stance as well. Right, he's very accomplished. You can see that in the stance. He's sure of himself, he's confident. You're going to like what he does, but he's going to be easy with it too. And he's not going to work too hard to show you um, what he can do, right? It'll just happen naturally. By the end of the 17th century, this French Baroque style was well established. And it was around this time that various notational systems were being developed to record the dance steps. There were three main contenders, Favier, Lorraine, and Beauchamp. All effective in one way or another, but Beauchamp's method won out thanks to Raoul-Angers Fouillet, 
who managed to publish the first instruction book on notation in 1700. And this is a page from that first book that was published. It's entitled Choreography. Although created by Pierre Beauchamp, this new method of dance notation is largely attributed to Fouillé, since in his publication, there goes my, my automatic, <laughs> since in his publication, he does not mention Beauchamp's contributions. I don't think that, I, I think that caused a little bit of a kerfuffle, but it's not as, as egregious as it is today to uh, use other people's material without giving them credit. The French Baroque dance steps at their core are merely stylized versions of basic natural movements, walking, running, jumping, hopping, sliding, turning, and even falling. Here's a table from Kellum Tomlinson's treatise showing these various movements. And we see over here on the right, just a little bit, it's cut off, but here we have some foot positions. So right here is what's called first position. If there are any ballet dancers out there, this is the same position that we still use today as first position, but just not quite as turned out. So there are little uh, round open holes here indicating the heels, and then these lines indicate the direction your feet are pointing. So that's first position, and then a little bit farther apart, second position, third position, one heel is in the instep of the other foot, you can pretty much see it there. You can, it's, 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 uh, it's pretty easy to follow once you know that those open circles are the heels and the lines are the feet. And then right up here, we have all the symbols of what we can do, all right? So again, these are natural movements. There's a bend or a sink and a rise and a bound and a hop and a caper and a fall and a slide. And then there are various other things ending with a few turns there. So these are all the marks that we need for any of the movements in the Baroque vocabulary. Now to, to put them into action, we put them on what is called a paw or a step. So we have our little dot down here, which means uh, it, it is similar to the heel here. And then we have the foot position up at the top. And connecting them is a line. And this line shows movement, right? So this line goes straight forward. There's nothing on it. So this is a very simple step forward. And we're going to try this uh, in, in just a few minutes. So that is a simple step. Along the way, you can do all sorts of things. You can bend and then step or you can rise while you step, or you can jump on the new foot there, or you can hop and step, etc. So what they've done is they've put all of these symbols along the line here to show you what to do, what actions to take. And again, all these actions are, are things that we do in the natural world. A lot of people think that Baroque dance seems very uh, artificial. And in some ways it is, but if you get to the root of it, it's really an extension of our natural world, right? They're just exaggerating things that we do naturally. And again, I am, I'm saying this because uh, I, I really feel like this uh, influences how we make music, right? If we can always get back to the natural world, if we can let our bodies just experience what happens naturally rather than what we've learned from modern playing oftentimes and then want to put back on, you know, take away. If we can come from underneath from the natural world, uh, things are going to be a lot simpler to learn. Okay, here's the simple step. As I said, this is where we start. This is our heel as we started. And we look up here and we see that our foot's going that way. So this means that it's the left foot. So this is a step forward on the left. I'm not going to say much about how to do it yet because we're going to try it out uh, later. But there's a lot of rhythm that goes into this step. And we do it every day. With every step we take, 
if you really analyze your step, you will find that it starts with a little impulse, it resists going forward, and then it arrives. However fast or slow you're going, it always has those three things. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And all of our notes also have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It, our notes always have some sort of articulation, even though it's, it's sometimes not sharp at all. And then we have some sort of movement through the note and then an end to the note. Um, so again, going back to this natural world and we'll try it all together soon. After we look at that simple step, then we can look at one that's more stylized. So what the Baroque dance does is they emphasize the beginning and the end by starting with a bend and ending with a rise. So this is called a demi coupe. It just amplifies the distance between low and high uh, of the uh, levels of the body by uh, addition of knee bends indicated on the figure by the line slanting downward, there's the bend, and indicated on line here that indicates the rise onto the toe. The differences in velocity from bend to rise alternate more dramatically according to the character, tempo, and beat structure of each dance type. The fluctuating velocity, nonlinear tension, and release within a prescribed beat hierarchy are all crystal clear when this step is put into action. And just as there are myriad ways to play a simple quarter note, the demi coupe can elicit many moods according to the character of the dance, whether it is an elegant minuet a moody saraband or a sprightly passapie. So this is kind of like our quarter note. And again, we're going to look at this and try it out soon. I just want to show you one more thing before we do that. Um, so here is that demi coupe. Here's that bend and the rise here. So that is going to start what is then called a step unit. This line here links the three steps together. It's a line of liaison and it makes a gesture. So this would be like perhaps one measure. And in duple time, the, the uh, rhythm of this would be quarter, quarter, half. Quarter, quarter, half. Um, and again, we'll try it later. I'm sorry I'm not there in person because then it would be a lot more uh, fluid back and forth. Uh, so this is called a step unit. Uh, it's binding together single steps into a bigger gesture. This is called a pas de bourre, a step of the bourre. And uh, this step, although it's called step of the bourre, is used in uh, virtually every dance that I can think of in the Baroque uh, repertoire and is even found in the minuet steps uh, that have uh, their own specific step. The pas de bourre is actually part of that step. Without going too much into deciphering this special Fourier notation, let me point out that this shows three steps. The first is a demi coupe. The next two are just simple steps forward, as we saw. As you will see, the first step on beat one is a rise on the toe. And according to the Baroque beat hierarchy, beat one is generally the strongest beat in the measure. Here, we see that our strongest beat is a lifted accent rather than a step into the ground. This is very important. This is different from the Renaissance dance that came before. And again, it's so important to the music making that we do. It means that the, the first beat of most measures, almost all measures, is the strongest. It doesn't have to be pounded into the ground, however, but instead we should think of it as being lifted out of the ground. So it's strong yet lifted, and that gives, again, our music a little more buoyancy uh, than, say, the Renaissance dance, which is a much more earthy sort of, of, of dance feel. Uh, another important point is that usually step units don't cross over the bar line. You know, we have all these uh, hemiolas and uh, a lot a lot of people really love 
finding the hemiolas and they're very gleeful when they find the hemiolas and they like to point them out and make everybody do them. Um, and uh, one thing I've learned by being a dancer so many years and doing Baroque dance so many years that uh, is that, and we'll see this later, there's a lot of uh, rhythmic interplay between the music and the dance, but the dance uh, invariably, almost invariably has the biggest step, the most important step on the downbeat. And when you play for dancers, it's really, really very important that you remember that and that you observe the bar lines and that you uh, prepare them so that the dancer really can start on the, on the downbeat. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's kind of funny to do at first if you're not used to thinking that way. And we have to remember that downbeats can be soft or fluid or striking or all sorts of different characters. But um, it's that impetus on the downbeat that's going to help with the buoyancy of playing our uh, Baroque music. Okay. We're going to try all of this out now. So I'm going to stop sharing. And anybody out there who wants to try this out with me, let's do it. Um, so the first thing, I think I'm going to tilt this down a little bit. First thing we're going to try is just that simple step. So if you just walk around the room and just observe how you're stepping and how your weight changes, and how there is a different tempo when you start, when you're in the middle of it, and when you end. It's just an awareness. You don't have to do anything different. But just feel the way that feels. You can go backwards or sideways. It's always the same thing. You're transferring weight, and in doing so, you have a whole bunch of different tempos as you take those steps. So now let's try a, a stylized simple step by just turning out our legs uh, from the hips, a little bit of turn out there, so that we have nice toes out as our dancing master instructed us. And now we're just going to take a step forward with our turn out so that our foot is a little bit at an angle. And then we're going to take another one and another one. So this is just a little bit more stylized walking with a little bit of turnout. And once you've gotten used to that, this is a crash course in Baroque dance, uh, we're going to try to enhance that step by adding a bend at the beginning and a rise at the end. Bend at the beginning and a rise at the end. And step and step. So we're just taking that natural step and we're making it a little bit bigger. We're emphasizing it, we're enhancing it. And then after that, we're going to make a gesture now. We're going to do that same demi coupe, but we're gonna take two more steps forward afterwards. And it looks like this. So we're gonna take a step forward and then take two more steps forward. And that's one gesture, and I can do it to the side, forward, then two more steps. That's a pas de bourre. And in duple time, the counts are quarter, quarter, half. So that's, that's a gesture. That would be one measure of duple time. How's it going? Yeah, good. Are there any questions or comments at this point? Having tried that? Is this making a little bit of sense when you're thinking about your music making of how you can get from one place to another? There's always an action and a reaction. Yeah. I see two, two messages. When do you see them? Let's see. No, that there was four okay. earlier. Okay. Good. When they can't see. So okay. can continue. Okay. 
All right. Good. So we're well on our way to being professional Baroque dancers. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen again. And hopefully it'll work. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, good. All right. When we put the steps together, dance phrases begin to emerge. Here we have the first page of a bourrée from Fouillet's 1700 publication, Choreographie. All right, so that's uh, the, the first dance treatise that was published that we mentioned earlier. And here we have the first page of our dance. And if you look here, here is our pas de bourrée. This is starting with two pas de bourrées. Here's one. And then there's another one that starts on the other foot. And they're both moving in the line of direction down the dance floor. All right, so our host, our king, our queen, our prince, or whoever is hosting the party is sitting up here. And our friends are all around here sitting and watching us dance. And there are only two of us dancing, a man and a woman. Whoa, don't do that, okay. And they're holding hands, these little claws say they're holding hands. And this is the, uh, the position that they start. So they're starting in third position. And then they both do pas de bourrées forward. And then they go to the side. They split to the side and then they go forward again. And this is our four bar phrase. If you see here, these are measure lines. These are bar lines, and here are the bar lines up here. So this goes with the first measure. This goes with the second measure, and so on. All right, so this is our four bar phrase. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later too. All right, so once we know what to look for in these choreographic figures, a new world opens up. I've learned so much about musical phrasing in general over the years by paying more and more attention to the character and energy of each dance phrase and how they are assembled throughout the entire dance. There are certain basic patterns I've come to expect in dance music and choreographies. For typical bipartite dances, for instance, bourrées, minuets, sarabans, and jigs, expectations are based on balanced groupings, typically some sort of four-part structure. Sorry. Either one plus one plus two or two plus two plus four. In the second half of the piece, the phrases are often extended. Four plus four or even eight bar phrases. The four part phrase is neat and tidy, symmetrical, balanced, much like the manicured gardens at Versailles. And here you can see the similarity in shape between these gardens and this first shape of the bourrée d'achille. And this is a very common shape, this kind of mushroom shape to have. And you see here that the two dancers are dancing in mirror image, right? So they're always in opposition to each other. And there's always this idea of being close together and then going far away and then coming around and meeting and being close together again. And then at the end, one turns forward and one turns back. So there's always this tension and release uh, in the placement of where these dancers are on the page. So that is the four bar phrase. Was I going to try that out? Let's see. Yeah, let's see here. The typical four bar phrase has four discernible parts. It has an action, a reaction, a contrast, and a cadence. Particular dance steps punctuate these phrases. Resolute jumps and strong cadences, for example, while softer slides and steps ending up on the toes indicate that more movement is to come. Illuminating the imperfect and half cadences. So the imperfect cadences would have something, some movement on the second half of the bar and the the stronger cadences would have something that's definitive on, on the downbeat, perhaps, 
um, to finish the dance so that we can really feel that even when we have rests on a half cadence on the second half of the bar that there's some movement some shape that happens there that will carry us through that bar in the case of this dance the bure de shield the opening sequence consists of two pas de bourrées forward one the action and the second one the reaction since it's on the other foot then followed by a more energetic step called the contraton de gavotte that takes them away from each other. This has a hop in it, so it's more active. And then we have a very calm half cadence, a rise and a slide through that, that uh, half cadence measure. And then we have that same phrase, but in a different shape. So again, we're gonna try these movements in a moment. Uh, but before that, I want to emphasize that although we tend to expect four bar phrases and this particular dance is in four bar phrases, there are a lot of exceptions. Oftentimes the dance begins simply with the four bar phrase, but then there might be a five bar or a six bar phrase just to keep us slightly off kilter. And this goes back to our expectations. Our expectations are the four bar phrase. So when the dance uh, choreography, the composer throws in another measure to the, the four bar phrase, it should be kind of shocking to us. It should open up our eyes and, and uh, make us wonder what the choreography is doing there to extend that phrase. It should feel uncomfortable until we get back to a cadence and more importantly, back to more uh, uh, four bar phrases that we expect. All right, so I want to again stop sharing here and I want to try just some simple movements of this first four bar phrase. All right, so uh, as I said, we have the, the pas de bourre, which is the three steps forward. And I'm going to do the woman's side there. We're going to do one pas de bourre. That's the first measure. And then the second measure is on the other foot. And now, we're just going to hop, step, step to the side. And I want you to do that in any way you want. When I say hop, don't change weight. Hop, step, step. And then to, to close off the phrase, I want you to rise up on your, your feet. And then I want you to slide forward. So it's a rise and a slide. And however you want to do that is great, all right? So we know the pas de bourre, so we'll do that. We'll do two forward. Right, left, right. Action, reaction, left, right, left. Left, right, left. The third bar is always the most interesting. It's always the most different. So we're gonna do our hop, step, step. Hop, step, step. And then our half cadence, a rise, and then a slide. So putting that together in a rhythm, we have one and two, one and two. Now, hop, step, step, rise, slide. How'd you do? Good? Okay, let's do it one more time. Let's try it again. Two pod raise and Hop, step, step, and up, slide forward. That's the first phrase, and this is one that happens a lot in the Baroque dance vocabulary, right? This is very typical. This is what I would expect from a bourre choreography, something like this. Okay, let's try it one more time. And then I'm gonna put on the music and we'll try it to the music. So a little bit faster. One and two and step, 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 step. Now hop, hop, step, step, rise up and slide. Good. Okay, I'm gonna put, this gonna probably be a little bit, uh, a little bit faster than that, but let's try it. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm... Can you hear that? Is it loud enough? Okay. It goes back by really fast, so uh, I'll just say how it goes first and then, let's see. Okay, so this is the A section. It's uh, the whole phrase that we did is the whole A section. So I'm gonna let one A section go and then I'll tell you the steps the next A section. So oh, let's see here. So here it is, and step, 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 hop, step, 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 slide. <laughs> it's very, very fast. Judy, can you make the music a bit louder? That's okay. The, that was better at the end there. Good. Okay. I'm going to uh, try to show you what it is. I'm going to try to get back in time to show you this, okay? Whoops. pretty fast, doesn't it? goes pretty fast. But what I would love for you to practice maybe after this is just the difference in feelings of all those steps, right? So these are gliding steps. This is active, reactive, and now really active, up, step, step. And then on that long note at the end, we have half note, half note. Right, so we have a whole measure of movement and the dancer's moving while the music is not moving in the middle. Um, is that ready to do it again? Yeah. All right, so just a, a little bit of taste there. Um, and in this particular dance for the A section, that repeats, that four bars repeats on the other side for the second A section. But for a lot of the dances, the, the choreography changes the second time round the A section. And in the B section, there are completely different steps. In the B section, you have much longer phrases and you have continuous steps, and this is usually what happens in dance music, is that the second half of the piece has longer phrases than the first half. All right, good. All right, again, just a tiny taste of these crazy dances. So that is a bourree. Whoops. Okay. I'm going to go back to screen sharing now. Okay. Okay, here, here's another. I'm sticking with this uh, Bure Dashiel because we're getting to know it now. We have our, our four bar phrase that we just did that ended here. And then here is the repeat of it here. And uh, up here it's written out all the way down, but it's, it's actually, this is a repeat of this. And you'll see that they're using the French violin clef here, right? So that the treble clef is on the, on the bottom line. This is a G clef, so it means the bottom line is a G. That is a G. So it is important and musically interesting, I think, to play the form. By this, I mean the musician should know which part of the formal structure they are playing at all times. Baroque dance, when choreographed well, illuminates this form and structure by providing us with a 3D analysis of the form. So it provides a visual for the form that we're playing. From a bird's eye view, this Bure d'Achille choreography we've been examining immediately reveals the basic shapes that make up the dance. 
The steps along these shapes outlined so beautifully on the page show to a great extent where the dancers are in the room at all times. Straight and curved paths often alternate and active jumps and hops along the way might transition into smooth turns and glides. In the ballroom, only one to two dancers perform at a time, as we saw, utilizing the entire grand space. And this is one reason why it's really hard to teach a dance class properly these days because, you know, you, you can have up to 50 people in the same class and uh, really what, what they need is each, each needs their own ballroom. They usually perform in mirror image as we saw. So they're always in opposition somehow throughout the entire dance. And although in this, as I said, in this beret, several dance phrases are repeated, most choreographies are through composed, even when the music is not. In other words, a choreography set to a bipartite dance air may have a completely different set of steps with subtly different phrase lengths for the repeat of the A section. Many dances are played twice through, including all repeats, and in most cases, the steps to the second playing of the dance are newly composed. This provides subtle differences that the musician can then reflect in his second rendering of the tune, perhaps linking two previously distinct phrases into a longer phrase, or changing character using different bow strokes, or adding more or less articulation. For me as a dancer, these sorts of differences are much more satisfying than hearing musicians add ornamentation to the second rendering of the tune that usually has nothing to do with the dance. And I think this is another really huge point that I, I learned from Baroque dance. You know, the Baroque dance doesn't just do the same phrase with more ornaments. They do completely new steps. And in those steps and the step phrases that we have on the page, you can see that they do play with different phrase lengths during each playing through of this section so that maybe the first time through the phrase will be one plus one plus two and the second time through it might be two plus two or it might be four or it might be one plus three. It'd be something a little bit different to, to add a little bit of interest but without having to rely on too much uh, ornamentation. This doesn't mean that dancers never ornamented. Um, the, the arms in general, uh, even though, as, as you've seen, we've been talking about the feet a lot on these uh, uh, choreographies, and the feet are, are very prominent, but the hands are not. We only know that they take hands and they drop hands. But in the treatises, they do talk about all sorts of different hand movements, from the wrist movements to the arm movements, uh, full arm movements to uh, movements from the elbow, they're all outlined there and they, uh, they do talk about what arms are appropriate for what steps as well. But there is a, a lot of room for interpretation when you're doing a choreography and this is one way that the, the dancer can ornament the dance. Um, yes, the arms act as ornaments and another way to uh, ornament a dance would be to add little beats with your feet or circles or more turns, you know, for the more virtuosic dances that uh, uh, both the men and the women did. The lures and the sarabands can be quite fancy. Um, so they can do that. However, it's not just an automatic thing that they do. Usually they have something that on the page that tells them to uh, do something completely different with their feet the second time around. Another thing that I think is really, really informative is the, the spatial aspects of the dance. Um, and this really informs not only the phrasing, but the either introversion or extroversion of the phrase as well. Um, in this dance here, you see uh, a big circle. This is the, the final uh, page of the Sarban per Femme that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the, the first page of it soon. But you see here, there's this huge, huge, huge circle that goes around the entire floor. And then they stop, they go back and forth here, right before the end. They do a very fancy step here. This is the fanciest step in the whole dance. And then they retreat, as most dances do, 
to where they began. So on, this is the second playing of, and the last time through, the, second, the, the third part of the piece, it's a tripartite piece. And it is the most continuous, biggest shape ever there. And it really makes a difference in how the musicians play the music when they can see this happening, this big circle going around the whole floor, rather than um, the other times through when it, it would be more disjunct um, and not such a continuous shape. So uh, just thinking about where you might be on a big dance floor when you're playing a piece, you know, uh, it will, will inform you a lot and give you a lot of ideas about um, how extroverted or introverted or subtle or uh, not so subtle uh, you, you w wish to be uh, within this big space. And for me, uh, having, you know, danced in, and played together for so many years, um, it really, I really feel it in my body when I should be moving big and when I should be moving smaller, even when I'm standing still playing my violin. Uh, so I thought I would just mention that to you. Um, another thing uh, that this, this shows us, you know, I said this is at the very, very end of the dance. It is the most unique shape of the whole dance. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. This is a solo dance for a woman, actually. Um, and this is usually what happens right before the final cadence. You have the most interesting thing happen. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is where this sort of shape would fall. This sort of shape would never fall at the beginning of a piece. It would never fall at the uh, repeat of the A. It might fall in the first part of the B, which is, again, if we think about that one plus one plus, um, I'm sorry, the action reaction uh, interest and cadence, if we think of that and apply it to the entire piece, then we would say the interesting part is the opening of the B section, right? That's our third part of the piece. And then the closing, the backing up here would be the end of the piece. So in that way, we can see that they save the most interesting shape for the most interesting part of the music where it's going to be furthest away from your tonic. It might be the most active. Somehow it's the different part. And then it gives you something that you can really hold on to and uh, something that we're expecting as we finish the dance back where we started. We're gonna look at this when, when I uh, work with the students, I'm sure. All right, so here is the beginning of this dance. Um, and you'll see that it is much more back and forth, right? So we go forward for a long time, goes, really goes into the music there too. They had to write the music around the, the, the notation. And then just a little bit of side movement there and side movement back. And again, this is another dance. Uh, this is from uh, Fourier's uh, choreography from 1700 um, that repeats the same steps on the other side when we repeat the A section. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, do some of this movement with you. This is a typical Sarban phrase. And since we're going to be playing some Sarbans and looking at Sarbans, um, I, I want you to know about this really special phrasing that often goes with the Sarban. Uh, before we leave, I think that might be everything that I need to show you. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And we're going to start uh, with this Saraband phrase, all right? Again, oh, I'm cutting off my head, sorry. Um, so our phrase, <clears throat> our phrase is four bars. That's what we expect. For Sarabands, we expect it to be either one plus one plus two or two plus two plus four, right? Those are the two things that we expect. So let's see if it happens here. So the first thing that we do is very simple. We're just going to point our foot forward, thong. That's all we do. We just take it and we point it forward. And then we're going on the second bar, the reaction to that is we're going to take a little step back 
and we're going to point back uh, with the other foot. So the first, move, uh, first measure, we point forward. That's a strong yet subtle movement, right? We don't move on two and three. And then for the second measure, we take a step back on one and we put our toe back behind us on two. So we have one and then one, two. Then we have our lovely pas de bourre, our three steps forward, one, two, three. And then we have a rise again and a slide forward, just like we did in the bourre d'achille, right? So we had motion forward and then stop, slide through. And you don't get to the end of the slide until the third beat. So all together, we have one beat in the first measure, one beat, two, three, and then one, two, three, and then we have three. One, two, three, then we have nothing, slide, end. One, two, three. So from the, the side, maybe it's more, that you can see it better from the side. First is one, that's our statement. Then we have a reaction to the statement. One, two, kind of hesitant there. And then we have three steps forward. One, two, three, rise, slide, end. Mm, resisting, resisting, because it's not the end of the piece, right? It's gonna go on. And then we do the same thing on the other side. Does that make sense? Can we try it again? We're going to point front first. One, two, three, and point front. Two, three, and step back. Point, three, and three steps forward. And rise, slide, end. Let's try the other side. And forward, two, three, and step, point, three steps forward, 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 rise, slide, end. Yeah. So do you see how that works? Uh, gosh. Just need to do that. Yeah, so it, uh, you have your action, you have your reaction, you have your motion, and then you have your stasis, right? Your resistance. And then you have your action, reaction, motion, resist, and, right? So you're going to see that in almost every four bar phrase in dance music over almost all of the dances, not all of them, but most of them. Um, very important. And again, in this dance as well, in the second half of the piece, it's more flowing and it's longer phrases. And especially that last page that we saw that had the huge circle that goes all the way around an eight bar phrase. So we will see that phrase again when we see more sarabans. But when you play a saraband, think of that. Now, one thing that, that you might not have seen was a very heavy second beat, right? Did you see any heavy second beats? They weren't there, right? The first measure, there's nothing. Second measure, there's a little point. Third measure, there's that intermediate step in the pas de bourre. And the fourth measure, there's a slide, right? Resisting that. So uh, when people say, oh, well, the second beat in a saraband is heavier than the first because of the dance, now you can say, uh, that's not true, right? Because it, it, it isn't true. Um, it, almost never do we have anything of that much importance on the second beat. There is one phrase, one, one dance step that does uh, really define what that rhythm is in the saraband. Um, and what I think it is, is a very horizontal beginning on one, which is strong, and two is a very broad, right? So I don't like talking about it as heavy and light or 
forte and piano or piano forte or whatever you want to call it, but it just has a different character, right? The first one is here and the second one is here. It's a little more ooey gooey, right? It has a little bit more resistance. So that the step that I was talking about that really illustrates that, that is not so common in the saraband, but you do see it, is called uh, the pacupe of two movements. So it starts with a very strong up, and then it has a resist slide, like we do at the end of that fourth bar, but it just takes two, three. So in time, it would be one and two, three. One and two, three. So uh, it's that broad thing that happens. You want to try it? Let's try it. Even if you step, step uh, on one foot, step, and then bend and resist as your other foot comes forward and then you step on that foot. So you step and slide step. You see how that feels? One. Yeah, very important in the saraband to, to know that, right? The second beat is important often, but it's not important in that we have to pound it into the floor and make it huge. Even if you have more notes on that second beat, it's broader, right? Think about the harpsichord. The harpsichord is, is not a forte piano, right? The harpsichord has to make its dynamics in a different way. And to do that, you have something that's a little bit more vertical, and then you spread something out on uh, the second beat and into the third. Okay. That's one of my big points, so I hope you got it. Let's go back. All right. All right, so um, just to show you what that looks like rhythmically, um, and what it does to the overall uh, rhythmic element of this piece. If you look at this, uh, the top line is the dance rhythm that we just did. Um, in that fourth bar, I have the first two notes tied because that's where the slide is, right? So our slide doesn't end until beat three. So I just made that a little bit uh, different from a half note, just to indicate that there's a slide there and then it stops on three. So if you compare that, say, to uh, the melody line, you see that the dance never has the same rhythm as the melody line. In fact, the dance never has the same rhythm as any of the lines all the way through. Oftentimes what the dance does is give a beat where there is no beat right? Especially like places like uh, the third bar, where it's only the second viola that has that third quarter note, right? So that's what the dance supplies. The dance supplies the note that is missing often. Um, and this is something, again, that I think is very uh, telling to us in that uh, when we have a note a half note, let's say, for example, uh, well, let's just take, I don't know, let's take the second measure of the, um, gosh, we'll take the second measure of the, the viola two line, right? So they have a half note and a quarter. And in that rhythm, we have another note right in the middle. Um, now, treatise writers, you know, Quance and, and a whole bunch of other treatise writers um, like to admonish us musicians for rushing the third beat of the measures, right? They say, you know, it happens all the time. It's really common and don't do it, right? So I, I like to think that with this idea that there's a dancer with you who is supplying that beat that's missing from your quarter note structure, uh, that will uh, allow you to resist rushing into the next note. Um, it also informs how you're going to shape the note that you're playing, 
right? So that you don't, are, you don't only think about the beginning of the note, but you think about how it's going to be shaped in that place where we don't have any change of note. I also like to, to look at this one in particular because the first bar has one beat, the second bar has two beats, the third beat bar has three beats, and then the fourth bar has, has actually it's, it's a, a dotted half because it's just one motion. But here you have a rise and then an end. So we, I have two. But in every bar there, we have a different number of notes, um, a different number of movements. So it really is like adding another rhythmic layer to the already pretty complex for such a simple tune movement that we have in the piece itself, the musical piece itself. Really, really interesting. I like, especially here, you see there's a hemiola here. The dancer almost never does a hemiola with everyone else. So the dancer and the bass line are going to be the ones that would have the strong downbeat here, right? They're the ones that are providing the foundation for that hemiola to play off of. And this happens all of the time. If you're, if, if you're playing a piece and there's hemiola in one part or two parts, or in this instance, four parts here, then there's all the more reason to not do it in the bottom part as well, because we really need that rhythmic interplay to make the hemiola special. If everybody does the hemiola, then I think it's not so special. And like I said, I think the only dance that I've really seen any sort of hemiolas or uh, um, holding over the bar line is the hornpipe, the English dance, the hornpipe. And maybe occasionally, very, very, very rarely, in other dances, but uh, it's really important to know, again, going back to what I said before, that the dancer almost always steps most strongly on the downbeat. How am I doing on time? 3.40. 3.40 and I go till four o'clock? Yes. Oh my goodness. Okay. I think perhaps we should hear uh, the wonderful Saraband played by our cellist. Would so Lisa, you if you can get ready and you can mute yourself, that'd be great. Wait, mute myself or unmute myself, you mean? Unmute. Thank you. <laughs> And why don't you also introduce yourself and what you're going to play as well. Okay. So I'm Lisa Tiedemann and I'm a senior and I'm going to be playing Box Suite Number Two, the Sarabond. And she has to wear the mask because she's playing from, she says, <laughs> the best role. Okay, yeah, I'm used to that. I, I spend a lot of time in masks with my students as well. Uh, Lisa, is there any way that you could get your cello into the picture? Or oh, yeah, you... yeah. Um, I'll just put this back a little bit. I mean, is that better? I actually cannot even tell. It's a little better, yes. I can almost see uh, where your bow is going to go. Yes, I see. Okay.
Lisa, yeah, what an amazing piece, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, so we've been talking about expectations and sarabands and what to expect from a saraband. Do you think your saraband gives us what we're expecting? Um, is it in four bar phrases? I mean, I've been trying to keep it in four, four bar phrases, mm -hmm. if that's what you're asking. Uh huh. And uh, what is the structure of each of those four bar phrases? Or how about the first one? What's the, what's the most important uh, measure? Um, the, I know that there's the... I know that the end of the the four bar phrase has that like has the has that like hold and then it uh, and then you have that like free freedom and then you have like the the next part. Yeah, yeah, that was that was really beautiful what you did at the end of the the measures. I really felt like. There was action and there was reaction, there was tension and there was release and all of those things were great. I think at the beginning, we could either look at this as being a sort of one plus one plus two phrase, or we could think of it as a two plus two plus four phrase, right, in the first half of the piece. Do you know what I mean by that? I actually don't. Okay. What do you mean by one plus four? one plus one plus two and two plus two plus four. Talking about the measures themselves. Uh-huh. So in, in a in a Sarban phrase we have an action, we have a reaction, yeah. we have something different, and then we have our cadence. Uh-huh. So can you apply that to your first four bars? Does it work? You want to try it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So I think it kind of works, but unlike the one that we had, we had a, a dotted half note and then a quarter and a half mm -hmm. uh, in our example. And right. what does yours do instead? Yours reverses them, right? So you have a quarter half mm -hmm. and then a dotted half, right? But the dotted half, the way you just played it was a release. And I really liked that. Now let's try the other version where you have two measures plus two measures, right? So we have action for two measures, reaction for two measures, and then a longer phrase, four bars to the end of the A section or to the end of that part. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so like two measures and two measures and then the rest of the four measures. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So that's not the end of the A section, but that's a different way to look at it. And that mm -hmm. also works, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say if you did it twice through, I would choose one time one way and another time the other way. Okay. Yeah. And then after that, so you had your two phrases there and the second one was a little bit more intense than the first one, wasn't it? Yes. Because it goes higher. What happens after that? Then, then it just like does a re kind of a recap. Uh, okay, and how would you shape that? Like yeah. at the very end, like it do do something like that. Uh huh. Yeah. So what if we started in measure nine? Can you start in measure nine and see if you can make a longer phrase with this one. All right. So this is going to be the most interesting part of the piece and you're going to make a longer phrase. Oh, you're not using your music? <laughs> no, I'm not using your music. Okay, I see where it is. Yeah, so you could take that phrase and even though they have the pauses every two bars, mm -hmm. you can use them as stepping stones to get to the third part. So Chum pa da dum, da da tum, ta da dum, da da dum, and then open the door at the top, right? So mm -hmm. it's what you do on that second note of the measures. You know, don't stop your bow, but it's just kind of like <gasps> you can't wait until you get to the next step up, and then what's at the top? Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful up there. I can hardly stand it. All right, try that. <laughs> Yeah, and for me, that, that's a really, really nice example of having this tension growing and then releasing, like kind of like a, a ray of sun or a, a little firework, you know, very, very <laughs> delicate one at the top. Yeah, and then the other thing you could do if you wanted to do it differently the second time is really make more difference with the pauses. Chum pa da dum, like you don't want to go there. Ya da tam ta da dum, and then it's okay to stop and take in what's there, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of what what I like to do with these simple dance tunes is is just 
really feel about where you want to go with the phrase and emotionally where you want to go with them and what affects you're going to use to get there, right? Um, so that's what I would do. And then in the second half, in the second half, you're going to have a little bit easier time, I think, getting from one note to the other for a longer time, longer phrases. So let's, let's start on the second half now and see if you can make a longer phrase. Good, yeah, let's just take that much again. And maybe this time we don't sit on that half note in that first measure, but we push forward a little bit. Yum, pa dum, ya da dum, ya da dum, pa da da dum. Like we're a little bit distracted, kind of. Yum, cha da da, da da da, ya da dum, pa da da dum. Something like that. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Try this now. Try not stopping the bow ever, right? So whenever you want to put a little space in there, keep the bow going, but just add a little bit of air and what I kind of like to call white noise or spittle, you know, something that's just kind of drooling a little bit at the end. Chum pa chum, cha da dum dum pom. Instead of chum ta tum, we're setting it down, down, down. Mm. Instead, we're going chum pa dum, cha da dum, but we're painting with latex paint this way instead of putting things down. So that's only going to last for a few few bars, and then you're going to get into this more horiz uh, vertical uh, frame of mind again when you get yum cha dum pum, yada tum pa da dum. Then you're going to go a little bit more vertical. So whatever you decide to do in one section, if you if you want to go horizontal like we're trying now, then the next phrase is going to have to be something different. So maybe. That one's going to be a little bit more vertical again, right? So um, the little notes that you play, right? The little jam, jabba dum, jabba dum. How are you doing that? How are you making them less important? No. Uh, you just. Well, what's the word for it? You just like. Make it, you, it's kind of like you have like more, more like, it's a, kind of like you have more energy, but like less volume and then like. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. It's important that they're less, uh, they're less important, right? I said important twice, but yeah. And one thing that you can do there is just use less pressure, right? So again, there's just more air in the sound. And again, really important, it, you know, if you tried these dance steps with us, you could feel that we're always constantly in motion. The body is hard. It's hard to stop the body in between movements, right? It's not a natural thing to stop unless something interrupts us, right? Um, the more natural thing is to keep going. And I think that's what we need to think about with our bow too. You know, how, how can we keep it going and still get the nice beat hierarchy and the lightness that you're getting at the end of the phrase? I think it can, can be even lighter by just giving into a little bit more air in your sound and a little less pressure and the idea of going from big note to big note 
to big now, right? So from measure to measure and measure. And don't stop on your journey, right? You can look, you can, you can jam, cha da dum da da dum ba da dum You can look like that, but it's not jam, ba da dum ya da dum ba da dum right? That's a different sort of affect. And I don't think it's what you're, you're going for. And you didn't do that. But let's, let's see about a little bit more uh, air and movement always. And I'm most concerned about the first measure. Okay, good. I can help you there. Use less bow on the first beat, even less bow on the next two, and then save your bow for that, that uh, second quarter. Yeah. So instead of pulling faster at the end, what, what note are you on? <laughs> It's a B flat and a D. Okay, so instead of going right into that, we can add more air. I'm always going a little bit by beyond the note at each end, but it's in the air. So instead of lying on it, I'm, I'm adding air. You have a baroque bow, right? Yeah, yeah. One thing about these bows is that you don't need to use the whole thing all the time, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And and the smaller the note value, maybe at this point, the little the less bow you need. And even here, think about uh, maybe traveling up to the middle, but just kind of sitting there, sitting there and then going on instead of right then you're you're kind of lost there because you're you're stuck at the tip yeah so just think <laughs> about saving that and adding a little air just try it last thing I say because I know I'm running out of time. I would probably slur those two. Because we don't want we don't want them to be too important, right? If you don't want to, to slur them. Just kind of be like you're on clouds. One more time, just that last phrase. That was beautiful at the beginning. That was exactly it. to play that last note to yum because by then you have us in the palm of your hand right you can do anything yeah very good so i would say play with air a lot think about motion between everything and maybe try not using so much bow all the time right so that you can make different colors with your pressure and your placement maybe closer to the bridge and away from the bridge another thing you can play with yeah um, okay, there's a one question. Um, I think it's related to what you're talking about of the mm -hmm. pressure. 
And can you talk about that? Would, is, is there such thing is even that too much pressure for, um, for the, how you play or sing and especially for the downbeat? Too much pressure. Uh, I think it's not about the amount of pressure, but it's about how you get in and out of it, right? So if you have a lot of pressure and you're pulling your bow uh, slowly, it's gonna be a bad sound. But if you have that same amount of pressure and you pull it a little faster, it's gonna give a different uh, effect, right? That's the same amount of pressure as that, right? So it just, again, it just, it depends on how you use that pressure, right? How long you hold it, how fast your bow's moving, where your bow is, is it close to the bridge? Is it a far away from the bridge? Uh, uh, things like that. So uh, when, when you're talking about your basic tools, which are pressure, bow speed, placement, and amount of hair that you have on your string, you have all sorts of different combinations that you can use there, right? And usually what you want to use is only one of those tools, maybe two. But what we like to do is use all of them at the same time. And that's when things start sounding the same and, and not breathing, right? So think about breathing with, with these, these four tools that you have. Great. Thank you. So um, this ends our uh, first section. And like I said, you don't have to sign off, and, but we're going to have a 15 minutes intermission. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll continue with our second half. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And talk about cadence a little bit because it's so important. OK. Go ahead. OK. So welcome back everyone. I hope you can see this. It says, what is a cadence? So I guess I, I was going to ask the group, what is a cadence? It's difficult to know, however, what people are saying, but usually what we think of as a cadence is it's the final uh, note of the phrase, right? It's the final note of the phrase. It's uh, the final note of the piece, um, but cadence has a lot of other uh, meanings as well. You know, somebody could have uh, a cadence of speaking. We talk about people's cadence of, of this, the Southern accent, or uh, there could be, I don't know, the rhythm of one's speech or the, the modulation or inflection of one's voice is, is the cadence of that voice. Um, it could mean the whole cadential phrase. And this is usually what I call a cadence and what the theorists, 18th century theorists also call the cadence is the whole uh, phrase that leads up to the cadence. Um, and then of course in French, sometimes the trill is called a cadence, right? And, and oftentimes found right at the end of the phrase, which is the cadence. So it has a whole lot of meanings. Um, the Latin, origin of its base is cadere, which means to fall. Um, and in the Renaissance times, in Renaissance dance, the cadenza that they do at the end of their phrases or at the end of steps is really a fall into um, a cadence. Um, but what I find fascinating is, is uh, the meaning of cadence as applied to the dances, um, because it really does define the essence of the dance. So that the bourrees have a different cadence or essence than a saband or a salsa or a waltz or hip hop. They all have their own different cadences. Um, and I think if we don't find the cadence of a dance piece, then uh, we lose its essence. And in fact, there are a lot of treatises on time and cadence uh, from the 18th century and basically these sections show the dance steps fit with it, how they fit with the music um, with small choreograph sequences and they can be in either duple time, triple time, quadruple time, which is our uh, compound time or a very, very slow uh, four common time. Um, but there are many nuances that, that go beyond just 
the rhythm of the steps. Um, so here is a, a really beautiful a summary of what a cadence uh, means, both in music and dance. And this is from Wendy Hilton's uh, book on dance of the court and theater that was published in 1981. And, and Wendy Hilton was really one of the pioneers of Baroque dance. She, she was one of the first to go out and, and research it and try it out and try to, to codify uh, the movements of the Baroque dance. Um, this is what she says, the term cadence covered the order and spirit of both the music and dance in a specific as well as a broad, sorry, I have this automatic thing, uh, as well as a broad sense. In its most profound sense, the term cadence meant the spirit, the rhythmic flow which made music and dance alive, the nuances and subtleties of articulation, the dynamic textures of motions which created the mood of every piece. And I think she's really uh, captured the, the, the essence of the, the meaning of the cadence, um, which is the essence of these dance pieces. Here's another one. Uh, by Louis Bonin, who uh, is French, but was writing in Germany and published this uh, um, dance, art, art of the dance in uh, Frankfurt and Leipzig in 1712, uh, while well, J.S. Bach was still alive. And he says that music is the soul of the dance. I love that. But without cadence, it is neither salted nor larded, and usually disorder and shame ensue. He's, he's not holding back on his, his words, you know, he's, he's, I think he's really issuing both musicians and dancers a challenge. You know, we, we need to acquaint ourselves with each dance type and we need to understand how it impacts the music we play and how the dance enhances the music through its steps and the flow, the phrasing, the rhythm, the formal structure and particular gestures, each creating a unique character for each dance type. So uh, this is why I wanted to, to uh, bring this up before I hear uh, the harpsichordists play, because understanding cadence is so crucial uh, to playing dance music, both for dancers and uh, dance music that wasn't written for dancing, and also uh, other types of music as well. And it's why a general knowledge of each dance form is important, even when we know a piece with a dance title is not meant to be danced. I get that question a lot, you know, well, why did they, why did they go to the trouble to name it a dance uh, movement? I mean, why, why didn't they just put Allegro or Andante or Adagio? Um, they, they always had their reasons for, for doing things. You know, I lost my, oh my goodness. I got a new computer and this did not happen on my old computer, I'm sorry. Um, Anyway, so cadence is important. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because, oh, there it is. Okay, good. I couldn't find my, okay. Yeah, so anyway, the answer to the question that I always get, do we need to acknowledge the dance aspects of a piece with a dance title if it wasn't danced to? My answer is yes, yes, it's very important. And I think that the composers chose particular dance forms because they were drawn to that particular dance form's essence and its cadence. So uh, yes, please, please do do the research um, and, and discover these wonderful dance forms through the dance as well as through the music. It's important. Okay, and now a little bit about the Alamand. Um, we have no choreographies for Alamans Aleman, as uh, we know them musically. Um, this is the only choreography that I know of uh, that is uh, in Fourier notation. And it's basically an Alamand of a different sort. It is an Alamand, a German dance. And you can see right here, this little couple, it's very small, but they're, um, they're holding, they have this funny hand hold with one hand behind the back and the other in front, uh, holding hands with their partners which is a, a handhold that was common in Germany, and you can even see it in the, the Lendler and other dances, the waltz, um, even later uh, in, in other centuries. Um, so this is the only one that we have, and it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, a rigadon, and Johann Matheson even said in his treatise that he, he thought it was more like a rigadon than an Allemand. So we see that it's in, in four up here with a pickup, 
and it's just a really jaunty sort of tune. <clears throat> so this is really the only Alamon choreography that we have, and it's not really applicable to playing Alamans. And uh, there were there were lots of Alamans, as we all know. Um, it often uh, opens a suite of, of dance pieces. Um, and it does always have this kind of uh, presentational element to it, right? It starts off the suite, so it sets up the key. It sets up the general mood that goes along with that key and, and acts as uh, a, a prelude to, to what will come before. And uh, Matheson likes to define things and likes to talk a lot and write a lot. So he says about the Almond that it's a serious and well-constructed harmony that is the image of a content or satisfied spirit and that enjoys good order and calm. So I like the idea of this good order, right? Um, I, I don't think Alamans in particular are, are the most uh, incredibly um, heart-wrenching pieces, shall we say. It, they don't go, for example, where sarbans go sometimes in that way. Um, it's more, uh, it's, it's more kind of just, um, more like a fugue, I would say, oftentimes. There's just this structure to it that's very rational. Um, and even though they can be quite beautiful, um, I think uh, just, just thinking of that rationality uh, helps to, to understand the Alamond. And so now let's go and hear this beautiful Alamond from the French Suite. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Wen Shangxiu, and uh, it's uh, um, my first year of the Artist, the artist Diploma on Harp Club. And uh, I'm going to play the Alamond and Serrand um, in D minor, French suite, five bar. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
yes. Really, really nice playing and uh, uh, incredible piece. Again, you know, both of them. Maybe we should go back to the Alamand first. Um, and I, I think, you know, you have a really nice feel for it. Um, personally, from a dance perspective, I really feel like at least the first and third beats should have a little space before them, not time-wise, but just articulation-wise, right? So that that nothing goes right from one beat to another beat, but you you just smell the, the roses a little along the way. So that it's, it's like with the bow, we put air in between notes. You have all air, every, every note has air, right? For you on the harpsichord. But uh, in the bigger beats, if we think about the bigger beats, um, just making sure that you just, set it on the downbeat, uh, just very with a nice articulation so that the dancer would know exactly when to step, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's no question. And that doesn't mean that you have to be right in time as we go along. And um, this is kind of, I felt a little bit like you were pushing forward all the time, right? And I would like a little bit more hills and valleys, right? So how can you do that? Um, can you start at the beginning and I'll probably stop here again. Yeah, sure. Okay, good. All right, good. Yeah. So you know, we've been playing these dance movements and dance movements in general are, are pretty straightforward. Um, compared to other uh, pieces. And Bach usually stays with that, but in pieces like here, he's throwing us some curveballs, right? So most of them are harmonic curveballs. They're, they're, he's giving us these chords that are incredible and we're not expecting them and they're coming at weird places, right? A, for example, in measure three on that fourth beat, oh my gosh, what's he doing there? You know, that was totally unexpected. And if you just play it right in time as if it's normal, then we miss it, right? That's really a very incredible chord right there. And then at the beginning, um, this, this goes back to the gesture and uh, knowing where, where we're going at all, at all times, right? So we always have a destination. We're always coming from somewhere or going somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So in that first measure, where do you think you're going? Um, I think uh, the music is in two. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that... Yeah, that's C sharp. Yeah, that's where you're going, right? So that's one place where you wouldn't want to go. Uh, keep your fingers down. Yeah, but yum tum yum pum tum pa da dum. And then you have that that seven, right? Yeah, ba da da. Right. So if you were an organist, you would just really, you know, you'd, you'd really do something with that. So we're in on the harpsichord. We need to make sure that that's spread in a way that it just feels like one event rather than right. And it's hard on the harpsichord, but you can do it. Right. Yeah. So our first destination is to the C sharp. And then from the C sharp, then it's just going to go right up. So you're going down and then up. <laughs> All right, so try. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yes, great, great. And then I think you get a little bit no more normal on the second bar, right? Then it's a little normal. And then right. So again, uh, let's let's mark that normal that normal chord, chord, so that's on the downbeat of, of the second one. But that was really great. I really felt that you were going down to the bottom and then you came back up to the top, right? So it's two gestures. And then you can sit, sit back and be a little more normal for the next couple of beats, right?
And there's another one, right? Yeah, good. Yeah, so there's another one. Yeah, yeah, so that one too. Don't don't get there too soon, right? Oftentimes what I'm feeling is that that um, he's giving you these rich harmonies and he's he's he, I really want to feel it from my gut and and you're just kind of saying, "Oh, there it is." Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. You know, and I want to hear, there it is. And oh, there it is. <gasps> yeah. So each chord has its own real flavor and character. And, and just how do you do that? It's the timing, isn't it? That's one tool that you have is the timing. And then the other one of spreading out, is it a slow spread or is it a faster spread or what notes are most important in there and, and making sure that your uh, bass notes are on the beat, right? And never before, mm -hmm. right? All those things, yeah. You've got you've got the power to really, really move us, right? But you need to know. You really need to know your harmonies and where the 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 piece is going at all times. And think about it not in the little notes that you're playing, but the bigger note values, right? Mm -hmm. I always tell my violinists that too, you know. And then the other things they just kind of fall into place. But always know where you're going in the bigger picture, yeah. I want you to get into that for me. Can you start right at the, the downbeat of five? And then when you get uh, to that B flat, I want you to really tell me what that's all about too. Because you see in that measure, on the second B, you have a, a C sharp, and then you have a D, and then you have the B flat. So, yeah. and then, uh, then you go to the E flat in the second, beat of that next measure, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, so those are a lot of little events along the way that make a bigger picture. And then finally, we get the D. Yeah, yeah? at the end of that third B. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. Okay, measure five. Good, good, good. Yeah, but you got to that E flat so quickly, I didn't know it was happening. The B flat was fantastic. It needs a little bit of an articulation, too, even though it's so going up and then down. I sang the wrong notes, but yeah. Yeah, good. And then going on, you would place that E because that's the real surprise. Yeah, good, good. So this all, this all goes back to this idea of um, action and reaction, tension and release, arsis and thesis. There are all sorts of ways that you can, can think about this. But as a listener, we should always be here or here, right? Or here, you know, so, so if there's some crunchy chord and we never really feel like it's been released, then we're going to spend the whole time listening to you like this, right? Not knowing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So allow us to breathe when, when you release the tension and allow us to know, really know when those harmonies are really scrunchy, right? I mean, they're scrunchy on the page, but you can tell us listen to this, right? Just by your timing. Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, uh, I want to stay on schedule. Um, so let us go to the side. And now here, it's a totally different story, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where Alamans, even with those crunchy chords, it's kind of rational crunchy, right? It's It's like, Art, artsy, you know, it's art, it's an artistic 
uh, mind game, I think, in the Aman. Whereas for the Sarabans, for me, it's from the heart, mm -hmm. right? So we have to really think about what we thought about in the Alamand, but more intimately and more deeply uh, when we play those. And one thing that's really, really interesting about this Saraband, I think, is the rhythm, which almost always through the whole thing is quarter, 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 half. Quarter, 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 half, right? That is a really interesting rhythm for a saraband. I mean, it's very saraband-like, but you don't usually get that at the beginning of a saraband, right? So it's very special right from the get-go. Yeah, and then I think for this one, we have uh, two bars plus two bars but plus four bars. I think that's our structure, right? And I think the second two bars are even crunchier than the first two bars, right? Mm -hmm. They hurt more. Right? I just love this one so much. So let's try it and, and see if, if you can really get to the core and move, move our emotions from the core. Right? Okay, good, yeah. So in this rhythm, tum, pum, pum, pum. It's like that second second bar is a bigger P, right? Like I'm saying pum, 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 right? It's like a big pom pom, right? It's it's the destination, but it's not going to stop there. But if we if we go pum, pum, pum. Palm, we're going to miss that, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's the same all the way through, especially the next two bars. C sharp, C sharp, C sharp, C natural. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, it's a timing. Great, great, great. That's really nice. Now I want you to do it one more time. Really feeling like two bars, two bars, four bars. That's it. Yeah. Then I, I really felt the motion there, right? I felt this and I felt this and then I felt this. And still we don't have a, a good cadence yet, right? They're all not to the tonic. He's always leaving us up in the air, right? Ah, good. Let's do the second half. Now these are longer phrases. Good, good. All right. So I know that there are little phrases within this, but I think that whole section is one huge swath of phrase, right? Mm, yeah. You have little stops all along the way, but it's not like the first part where we do this, this, and this. Now we have this, this, this. It keeps growing, growing, growing like a mushroom mm -hmm. um, all the way through. And that doesn't mean that you don't keep 
placing those downbeats when you need to and all that kind of stuff and enjoying the chords. But it's just this urgency to get through the whole part. Let's try it and see what happens. And Julie, I just want to uh, remind you the time. Okay, thank you. This is the release. Yeah, I liked that. It was just really, really, and then all of a sudden things are a little bit easier, right? So we have our, our intense section. It's that third section of the piece, and now we're going to go home. So let's just play this last part, and I think uh, see about what you're going to do with the phrasing. it all right beautifully done thank you thank you very much okay so we have one more we've got the beautiful pasacalia and when do we finish 5 15 yes. 5 30 5 15 okay nicole Nicole, are you still there? There? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Hello. Hello, Professor. Hello. Should I start? Yes, please. Okay. Just um, the, um, what piece are you playing? We only know that. Yeah, Beaver.
Bravo to you, Nicole. Yeah. That, that's a workout, isn't it? It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, what's your story here? What, what, what are you trying to portray? Uh, I, I think always that is like a speech in, a, in different ways in which the interpreter is trying to say the same thing, but in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think I'm trying to find new ways to say the same, if that makes sense to you. So that, that's been my process with this piece. It's okay. very interesting. It's very fun, but it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, what sort of characters are in your piece? Um, there are some Dolce sections that I, you can find in the Adagio. I feel that it's like a woman. woman. And sometimes when you have uh, more uh, shorter notes or sections with shorter articulations, I feel it's more martial, more like another like a man or something like that mm. uh, yeah that's that's what i think i'm i'm trying to to say okay and do you know about the little picture that's at the beginning of this pasacalia yes i i've seen it and what is it uh i don't know if my computer had a very bad resolution but i couldn't i couldn't i tried to see what was it but i couldn't i don't know yeah okay i'm asking you all these leading questions so i'll just get to the brunt of it um the picture shows an angel taking care of a little boy right the guardian angel is overlooking uh looking over the boy and making sure he he is um safe during his journey this is my interpretation but the picture is of the uh, angel looking over a boy and it comes after these 15 incredible pieces of called the mystery sonatas right and they each have a, a, their own little picture of of what each sonata is representing so um i i really think you have a lot of energy and verve um i'm wondering if perhaps there could be a little more um little boy in it as the journeyer and yeah. Also, a little bit more fluttery angel in some sections that's looking over him. So I think you have a nice, big, robust sound, but I think you could do a lot to explore the other side where it's, it's, uh, it's more suggestive, right? It, it, it's um, not so extroverted, but it makes us think a little bit. And I think one of the, the beauties of this piece is that it is a journey, right? So it's not just various... Um, characters coming in and out but it's the same character that's going through all of these different emotions and journeys and um i think in your landscape it's it's pretty rocky and it's pretty a uh, lot of, of hard lines and and things like that and i think perhaps sometimes he's going through forest and grass and you know some, sometimes perhaps it doesn't have to be so so uh, yeah, and that's going to save you too. I mean, you're young now, right? But I, I like to tell my students I want them to play for a long time, right? So we find ways to relax and, and to um, save our bodies. You know, this is the time to do it, right? Because if we wait too long, we're going to be all crippled and then we won't be able to play anymore. So um, I would go back to what we were saying about the natural stance, right? The, the noble stance where we have relaxation in the upper body. And I like that you're not standing stock still, you know, that's not good. But I think your movements are all the same, kind of. And I'm not sure that you know how you're moving. Do you know how you're moving? Uh, sometimes. Okay, yeah. So I would really think about that because sometimes I think it would be really very powerful if your movements were more still, right? And then when something is grips you and, and you, you feel like moving a little bit more, then it's going to be much more powerful. So I guess I'm just trying to increase your range. And if, at the very, very beginning, the very first bar, right? This is something that we expect from a passicalia, right? This is how many passicalias start. But still, I want to be amazed and I want to be uh, 
surprised a little bit by this opening and by the character of each of these notes. You know, we were talking about this four bar phrase. Well, here we have this four bar phrase in four notes, right? We have the action, we have the reaction, we have the tension, and then we have the release, right? So, yum, dum, boom, boom. Yeah, and that has to be so clear to us from the very beginning that we remember it through the whole piece, right? That is a big undertaking, right? That is a big responsibility for you. So we can't just go whizzing by it, right? It's the most important measure you're going to play, right? And when you play those four notes, you're going to have four different bow strokes. You're going to have one that starts, that's a little more straightforward, right? And then you're going to have a reaction to that. Then you're going to have one that's concentrated. Then you're going to have one that's released, right? So. Four different bow strokes through the whole thing. Yeah. So, enough talking. Why don't you play the opening? Yes, I'm going to stop you right away. Um, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm known for this. <laughs> Stopping and working on one measure. All right, that was great. Now I want you to play it in a different character. Right? So what was your character that time? Probably didn't have one. Okay, choose a character for this one. Choose a character. You don't have to tell us. Just show us. Yeah, already better. Now, a couple things. I'm here, I hear you sniffing a lot. And sniffing, the way you're doing it, makes us ease, you know, just stiffen up like this. Breathing is good, but if you do it without thinking about how you're breathing, then it's not going to help you. It's going to cause tension where you don't think you're, you're causing tension. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that you have that long bow, and you like using the whole thing a lot, right? You're using the whole bow all the time. Yeah, so I think this is something that you could really, really experiment with. And um, yeah, just using little bits of it here and there and adding air and thinking about not only the notes that you're playing, but what come in between the notes, right? What happens in between your notes to make that phrase happen? So try it one more time. I had, I had one... Uh, one teacher who asked me to play with my mouth open and it, it actually helps to relax. I know it, it feels really funny. You, you feel like you're, you're, you know, like that. But I encourage you to try it just, just once. Just keeping your mouth open and your throat open. So I let you play even more than one, <laughs> one bar. Yeah, how'd that feel with your mouth open like that? I yeah, it feels better, actually. Yeah, it opened up your sound a little bit, and that's, that's actually what I found, too, when I started doing it, that it relaxes our face a little so that we're not so tense. Yeah, okay, so you have your four notes, and then you have them again. So make sure that you, you pause and you, you play those four notes, and then you play the next four. 
and then you play the next four so that you're not playing four and then four and then four and then four, right? Because then we can't, as listeners, can't breathe, right? So, yum, tum, 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 yum. You have much more time than you think to get to the next measure. And if it's maybe, you know, a millisecond late, we're not going to notice. Wow. I think. <laughs> Your teacher might kill me, but <laughs> let's try it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry, that was too early. You were you were even not holding that last note the whole value, right? Try it again. really much more open and convincing to me. Now I want to know what you're going to do next. I'm not afraid anymore, right? I'm curious to know what you're going to do. But it takes time and playing with time. It's just one of the great pleasures of being a performer, right? We get to play with time, right? And we get to move the, F, the motions of our listeners with that. It's a very powerful tool, not to think just of the notes you're playing, but of the time in between the notes and in between the phrases. Very, very important. Okay, one last thing for, for a technical thing. So you had that beautiful opening, and then the second time you add a note, right? And when you added that note, you, you change strings so that your bow angle was on a new angle, right? On that new angle. So what happens if you keep your bow angle and, and your elbow angle on that lower string angle, right? And then just add in the note from that angle. So you we don't have to go jam tam pa dam, right? But with ja mm. The strings are really close together if you look at them. It's not that far, yeah? So think about just not going over to the A string all the way. Maybe play on, on the D string side of the A string when you add that note. See how that feels. One more time, just the beginning. sorry that I have to stop you and that we don't have more time because I really love the direction that this is going. Yeah, now, now I'm really interested in what you're going to do next and I really encourage you to think about uh, just different colors and different terrains that this little boy and the angel are going through on the softer side of things, right? And I think in this way you're going to be tired at the end but it's not going to be a marathon tired. It's going to be within mental tiredness because you see you've told such a profound story. All right? So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, brava. Brava to your teacher. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Wen, for, for everything. And happy birthday, Nicole. Oh, my. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you, Julie. Um, do you have a, a 
quick question, and because I know we're running out of time, but I think one of the um, general questions that people always wonder as a student is that when you play um, dance music, for example, Bangro, a lot of them, then they're not meant to be danced. However, they have a dance um, move, their dance movements. How do you decide on the tempo and how, you know, how much you want to um, make them connected with, to a dance? Okay, so this goes back to a couple of things. At the very beginning of my talk, you know, I said tempo is not the number one concern, right? Um, and then I also later said that it's the cadence of the dance that means the most, right? So um, putting those together, I would say you very much need to know the essence of the dance. I mean, think about it. If we played a waltz without knowing how to waltz, will it sound like a waltz? You know, uh, just pick any sort of dance, salsa, anything. Um, if we played a march and it didn't sound like a march, is it a march? You know, why do they have these titles? They have the titles because they want to invoke that sort of character, right? So how do I, how do I decide the tempo? Well, first I decide the character, right? And a lot of these dances can have a whole bunch of different character, uh, tempos. I was going to talk about the saraband in this way because there's a, um, a treatise, I guess, or a collection of works by La Filard who uh, wrote these uh, song tunes to dance airs. And these tunes all have metronome markings on them that were uh, divided, uh, um, they were put there by, by watching a pendulum, right? So they are, they are very specific metronome, I say metronome marking, I mean pendulum marking, right? But they have a tempo to each of them. And in that volume, there are three different sarabands. And they're in three different time signatures. And they are in three different tempi, right? So you can have a whole range of tempos for various dances. It's just what is the character of the saraband, first of all, in general. And then what is the piece that you're playing? What sort of character does that bring to this general character of the saraband at the same time? But really, really, really encourage you to uh, look into the dance forms themselves and see what the steps are, see how they look, and, and uh, really internalize those ideas before you decide tempo and character of your piece. But I would say also that uh, more the exception than the rule is to go with something that's, uh, that we expect. We should need to follow our expectations before we uh, start saying, well, you know, this wasn't dance, so we don't have to do this and we don't have to do that. And then pretty soon it's just not, not what the composer intended, I think. Um, and do you have a book um, a recommendation for like those uh, people or the musicians say they don't have those um, opportunities to learn how to, uh, the dance step and where they can start to understand um, the dance movements? You know, I think even better, um, Carolyn, Caroline Copeland has a dance workshop that she does every week and I think it's free um, and it's for musicians and dancers. And I think that would be a really great place. It's not, I hate to say it, there is not one really great book that will tell you all the answers. Um, and the YouTube clips that you'll find, most of them are not so great. I mean, there are some good ones. But I like Caroline's classes a lot, and I would rec highly recommend them to people. Thomas Baird also has courses, and, and when I can send these, these uh, uh, email addresses to you. Um, and, and now that they're all on Zoom, you know, you can do them in your house and nobody's watching and, and uh, you can really learn a lot uh, from just doing that with, with these uh, teachers. And if I ever do any workshops like that, I'll let you know as well. But really, it's, it's, I think that's the best way to, to, to learn. Yes, I agree. Yeah, that'd be great if I can, and then I'll share that with um, the, the students. Well, I would like to thank um, Julie for this uh, amazing workshop. 
and it really show us a different perspectives, not just in the dance music, but then also in the music that we play. And I totally agree. I can't agree more that more I play, and then it's true that I think of the music differently too. Really, it's from the nature. I mean, we all know spring, summer, fall, and the winter, and we know what's coming. But if you look at it, every fall is different, and that's why we always amazed by that. And it's always because of the nature, and then how do we enjoy the nature, and then the, how that related to to um, what we play, and then the music we make. So I really, um, can we just say I'm yourself and give um, Julie a big applause. Aww. And I hope that this is just the beginning of a series of a many um, more because I, movement and music, it's one thing I believe in, it connected and really make you a better musicians. And sometimes they actually help us to understand and, over, and even help us with our tools and then technique in many, many different ways. So we're not just really um, focused on one thing, but we see a bigger picture. So thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. And many of you, if you missed the first part, and I get a lot of messages saying that if you can, if it's recorded, yes, it is recorded, but um, because of a copyright, I won't be able to share the recording privately with you. Um, but our school is going to stream this video again on our website. And if you email me, I'll let you know when that happens. Okay? So thank thank you all again. And thank I'll you everybody. Bye.